It's a great pleasure for me to introduce and welcome the next speaker for today, Dr. Suzanne Brander. Dr. Brander is Assistant Professor at Department of Fisheries and Wildlife at Oregon State University. Previously, Dr. Brander was Assistant Professor at University of North Carolina, Wilmington. She also held positions as Environmental Analyst and Project Scientist at Western Solutions. Dr. Brander obtained her PhD in toxicology and pharmacology from UC Davis and her master's in environmental sciences and policy from John Hopkins University. Dr. Brander's research is currently focused on effects of stressors such as emerging pollutants, plastics, and changing climate on aquatic organisms. Her research is currently funded by NOAA, EPA, and NSF. She has presented on plastic pollution to the legislature in Salem, Oregon, and on the Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. Today, Dr. Brander is presenting her work on the effect of micro and nanoplastics on biota in aquatic environment and what we know about them. Welcome, Dr. Brander, and please take it from here. Great. Thank you so much for having me today. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. <clears throat> and like was mentioned today, I'm going to be talking about some research that my group um, and other collaborators are conducting on microplastics. Um, and this is thinking about both effects as well as risk considerations across aquatic taxa and different types of habitats. So I'll walk you through a quick outline here. First, I'll give a brief introduction, then talk a bit about different effects that are seen um, by taxa and habitat. I'll talk about a tire wear study we're currently conducting at Oregon State University, um, and then get into a bit of uh, some approaches we're thinking about in terms of risk assessment, um, as well as a summary. So we know from, from what we've read, and um, if, you've, if you've picked up um, a newspaper lately or, or looked, at, um, looked at the news online, we know that microplastics are ubiquitous in the ocean even at relatively remote sites that are distant from urban activity or fishing. Um, global estimates for microplastics on the seafloor are currently at about 14 million tons, and there's about twice as much plastic estimated to be on the seafloor than there is on the surface um, as it sinks, as its density changes, as it weathers. The ocean is not just a sink for microplastics, um, but a paper published in 2020 also found that it, it is, has become a source. And so as the, um, as the waves are sort of creating bubbles and aerosols, some of those aerosols can contain micro and maybe even nanoplastics, which we haven't yet determined. Um, aerial deposition has been documented globally. Air, uh, air exposure is probably the, uh, the highest route of exposure for humans. And microplastics um, presence in sediment can also affect microbial communities. So we're learning a lot about sort of the, the downstream and, and often complex impacts that plastics can have on, on ecosystems beyond just the um, aesthetic uh, concerns about its presence. So another big concern about plastics, of course, is that they can be transferred through food webs. Um, we've known this for a long time. Uh, we know that zooplankton and small organisms that uh, can maybe more easily mistake microplastic particles for food are ingesting them, and then those animals are then, of course, in ingested by uh, predators. Um, what is still up in the air is really how bioaccumulation of microplastics works. It appears that larger microplastics do not bioaccumulate in sort of the traditional manner. And when I say that, I mean, if you're thinking about something like a hydrophobic contaminant like DDT or PCBs, which we know are going to increase in concentration as you move up the food web, microplastics um, that are larger can be quickly excreted. And that may be why we're not seeing this trend towards bioaccumulation in larger animals. Um, what we know a lot less about are nanoplastics, um, which potentially are small enough to translocate, and maybe there is maybe more potential for those to bioaccumulate, but we don't know yet. So still a concern that um, animals that are larger can still consume microplastics, even if they're not feeding on them directly from, from their prey, and potentially those plastics can end up on our dinner plates. And research on plastics has expanded exponentially. 
um, looking at um, this graph, if you're looking at the estimated number of papers, um, this is on Web of Science. You see that from 1980 to 2010, there were very few papers in, in all three of these categories, response, ingestion, um, presence in water. Um, but then, of course, as you get to 2010, you see all of those publications ramp up. Um, but you can see that work on responses to microplastics across taxa is still on the lower end of, of uh, that publication, those publication numbers. And so that's something that we're still sorting out. And a lot of the data that we have are, um, are really limited to polystyrene and polyethylene spheres because many of the earlier studies on microplastics were done with commercially available particles rather than more environmentally realistic shapes and sizes and maybe weathering um, states, for example. So that's something that's still a big knowledge gap. What we know about toxicity to aquatic life, though, is, is growing. We do see um, a lot of evidence that both size and shape matter, that depending on the size of the plastic, you may have different mechanisms of toxicity, for example, or depending on the shape, fibers may potentially be more toxic to some organisms. And across sizes and shapes, plastics appear to cause oxidative stress, maybe just due to their presence, the presence of a foreign object in a tissue or in a cell if it's small enough. Um, and so upon exposure to microplastic cells can produce reactive oxygen species that then can proceed to cause structural damage and potentially higher, higher order effects in the animal. And associated pollutants can influence toxicity in some cases, but it seems that for the larger microplastics that are readily excreted, that they are not present within the fish or other organism long enough to leach out pollutants in considerable amounts. And that, that has been confirmed by a number of different studies, um, including one that my group did on phthalates a couple of years ago. No leaching was, was found over about 120 hours or five days, but the large surface area to volume ratio of smaller plastics, particularly nanoplastics and very small microplastics that can translocate. And so we're talking about plastics that are smaller than 10 microns um, could increase adsorption of chemicals if you have something translocating to a tissue and, and staying there for a longer period of time. And we know <clears throat> there's a recent study looking at textiles, looking at fibers, and did definitively determine that leachates from textiles can cause toxicity. It's just a matter of how much um, is needed to cause that toxicity and how long that plastic has to be present within the organism to lead to um, to added toxicity beyond what the animal is already exposed to through its food and water um, and the air. So we know that pelagic organisms, and these are organisms that of course are swimming around in the water column near the surface, we know that behavioral responses are common across fish and pelagic invertebrates to plastics. Um, microplastic exposure can also reduce feeding rates and can change how animals select prey. So a lot of these kind of subtle effects that could scale up to effects on, on populations if they're occurring frequently enough. A swimming speed and directionality can be affected. And I'll talk a little bit about um, work that we're doing in that area with larval fish and, um, and early life stages of invertebrates. A development in larval oysters has shown to be impacted um, and across many different taxonomic groups, you do see increased production of reactive oxygen species. Um, and the graph I'm showing over here is from a study in rotifers completed in 2019. And they saw that the time to the first batch of eggs in these rotifers was increased, but only if they were exposed to this very small size of plastic. So this is 0 0.07 microns or uh, 70 nanometers. So it, you can see from this study that size does, does in fact matter um, in, in some cases. For benthic organisms, we see some similar responses, but of course these are often organisms that are more sessile, stationary. Um, corals are impacted via dec decreased growth rates. You get impacts to symbiont cells and tissue damage. Crustaceans such as lobsters have decreased weight. Um, a lot of what um, is seen in terms of decreased growth rates 
decreased mass um, upon exposure to plastics may have to do with the sense of false satiation that there is um, a food dilution effect that the animal thinks it's full because it's eaten a piece of plastic, but it's not getting any nutrition from that from that piece of polystyrene or, or whatever it happens to be. <clears throat> and survival and reproduction, as you can see in the graph here, um, are affected in some organisms such as mole crabs. Um, so for these mole crabs, it affected both survival, and this is exposure to fibers, as well as the number of days an adult crab could hold viable eggs. So those are apical endpoints that are considered to be important for risk assessment, and that could, could lead to um, population level effects. And reactive oxygen species are also uh, produced in benthic taxa as well. So seeing, seeing that effect kind of across the board. Um, so we see a myriad of effects in, in different aquatic organisms, and those effects are summed up here in this figure. So thinking ev about everything from exposure route to what's happening at the cell and molecular level, the organism level, and the population level. And so you see things like reactive oxygen species and stress and effects on growth um, and effects on behavior popping up in these different groups. Um, beginning to, so we're beginning to converge on some commonalities here. Um, and the other thing that's really important to remember, though, and I've been talking a lot about what effects are seen, is that in almost as many studies as effects are seen, you have you have similar studies where no effect is observed. And so as a as a research community, we are still really sorting out what is driving these effects and the variability that is seen between responses between studies, how much of that is true variability, how much of that is because we are not all using the same standardized approaches when it comes to toxicity testing and that we really need to standardize those so we're comparing apples to apples when we're thinking about um, assessing risk. So that's kind of where the field is right now. We're starting to see some of these same responses pop up, but um, there are a lot of questions about how that differs between plastics, sizes, shapes, um, and, and tox taxonomic groups as well. So I'm going to get into tire wear particle pollution here because that has been and it's now classified as a, a type of microplastic in the state of California. Um, and there are discussions about this in, in Europe as well. But tire wear particle pollution is now known to be a pretty sizable fraction of microplastic pollution in urban estuaries. Um, in the US, there have been extensive studies done in Charleston, South Carolina as well as in the San Francisco Bay estuary and both, um, so east and west coast, and both areas have considerable tire wear particle pollution in their sediments. Um, and it's also been detected in a variety of different fish species off the coast of, of South Carolina. And what's happening here is that um, tire wear particles from car tire wear are emitted into the air. Um, they can then be um, kind of Resuspended, atmospherically transported and deposited into water bodies. And of course, we're also seeing a lot of runoff from stormwater and this um, source of tire wear particles was determined in a recent study out of the San Francisco Bay estuary where in some places they were finding, I think it was 60, 60 particles per gram. Um, in the sediments of, of the San Francisco Bay. And this was microplastic sized tire wear. So this, these were particles that were above 10 or 20 microns in size, but less is known about nano sized, the presence of nano sized tire wear particles. So in our group at Oregon State University, and this is a research group that consists of my lab, uh, Dr. Stacy Harper's lab, who she has a split appointment with engineering and the Department of Toxicology here, as well as researchers out at the Hatfield Marine Science Center looking at oyster, uh, responses in oysters. Um, and then we all collaborate with a group out of Western Washington University led by Dr. Wayne Landis, and he is doing uh, some risk assessment work um, using the data we produce to parameterize some of those uh, risk models. But 
the the goal here of our work is to use more realistic plastics and of course that can be challenging you know, trying to create your own plastics um, takes time it it is it is challenging to create large enough amounts but um, all that being said i am showing here some examples of milled plastics so these are plastics that are created with a cryo mill basically a, a you can think of like a large uh, pumice stone with um, liquid nitrogen added in, although of course it's a little bit more complicated than that. But so grinding particles to specified sizes using um, different filtration steps. And so these are some SEM, uh, scanning electron microscope images of tire wear particles. This is polyethylene terephthalate, which is used to make water bottles, polypropylene and polyacetic acid which are both used to make straws, although polyacetic acid is the bioplastic um, that many companies are, are shifting to. And so we were looking at, for example, the difference between responses to polypropylene microparticles and polyacetic acid. And the other idea here is that we want to compare responses to the microplastic fraction, which is the one to 20 micron um, fraction here, uh, with the nano particle sized fraction, which is less than than one micron. And so all of the studies I'll talk about today are looking at both of those, both of those size fractions from particles created in house. So, of course, you know, there are so many plastics and so little time. Um, microplastics are um, are a, a broad category of pollutants, and you can't just test one type of microplastic and assume that the response you see is going to be carried over to other types of, of, of polymers. And so one way to tackle this is by using high throughput testing approaches. And so that's what we're doing um, at Oregon State to conduct assays with early life stages. And this is across plastic types, sizes, as well as different concentrations. So trying to get at that dose response curve. And results from these shorter term tests, uh, the plan is that these will lay the foundation for the design of chronic exposures. You know, things, getting at things like effects on reproduction, effects on potentially on offspring even, um, which we see with soluble chemicals. So would like to also probe, probe that with, um, with plastics as well. So here are some images of different species that are used in testing here. Um, so this is uh, the Pacific oyster. We've got mycid shrimp, Daphnia magna, that's a clodocerin. Uh, Manidia berylina and uh, Danio ririo, which is the zebrafish, and these are all standard uh, model organisms. Um, but what makes this approach unique is that we're looking across freshwater all the way to marine strength salinity. So also thinking about how abiotic factors might play a role in um, influencing toxicity. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about some studies that uh, we've been doing in, in my group, which focuses on marine and estuarine organisms, Manidia berylina and mycid shrimp, or A. bahia. Uh, so this is marine and estuarine salinity um, and looking at tire wear particles at the micro and nano fraction. Um, we exposed both organisms in early life across three different salinities to think about the effect of salinity since um, we do know that for nanoplastics, that salinity can affect how those particles behave, and so sometimes they agglomerate more or stick together more. So it's important to think about how those effects might change because of the behavior of the plastic. And we expose them to 60, 6,000, and 60,000 particles per milliliter. So tried to aim for that low concentration as being close to what would be seen in the San Francisco Bay. And then getting into unrealistic concentrations because we want we're wanting to see the that entire response um, getting getting a good a good response curve, which will allow us to predict future effects um, and also means we can better parameterize um, risk assessment models. So the fish embryos we use hatch out into wells. Um, that are that are pictured here on this screen. Um, they're exposed for 96 hours post hatch with daily renewal, and the mycids are exposed for seven days. Um, and this is per uh, EPA protocols, and they are two days post hatch. And so all of these animals are, are cultured on site, and we looked at behavior 
growth and ingestion in both, um, both species. And behavior is assessed with um, something we call a Manidia vision observation chamber. Um, this observation chamber, which is made by Noldus Ethovision, was originally designed for larval zebrafish, but now it's used across um, many different types of aquatic organisms. And so we acclimate the animals for 10 minutes, then we record them for 10 minutes, and that it consists of three cycles of light and dark. And this um, instrument provides really precise recording of behaviors using video tracking software. So instead of having someone staring at a screen and clicking, you know, how many times does the animal turn? How many times does the animal change direction? You have um, all of that being recorded by the computer. And so it really reduces that, um, that potential for human error and makes things more consistent. So here are some results from some recently concluded work. Um, and again, this was exposure to tire wear particles across three different concentrations, as well as three different salinities. So it was kind of a, a gigantic experiment, but we, we saw some interesting, interesting results. So we decided it would be important to confirm that particles are being ingested. This is difficult to do at the nano size, but it can be done um, at the microplastic size. And so we see here, um, you've got 15 parts per thousand in red, 20 parts per thousand in green, and 25 parts per thousand in blue. Um, and you can see that ingestion differs slightly depending on the salinity of that water. And you're seeing lower ingestion in both cases at that 25 um, parts per thousand salinity, that higher, higher strength salinity. And we're doing some studies now to look at how particles may, um, may behave differently in the water at those higher um, salinities. And that might be why we're seeing that effect. But we do know they're ingesting them, but at relatively low levels. They're not, you, you put 60,000 particles per mil in the water and they're not, they're only ingesting, you can see for the, for the um, mycid shrimp, they're only getting up to about four particles. Um, at the time they were assessed. And for Manidia berylina, it's even, it's even lower, only between one and two at that, at that mid salinity. And then down here, we're looking at growth and we did a width length ratio. Um, and you can see that for the micro fraction across salinities that we consistently see a decrease in growth. Um, and if you compare all of those different treatments to one another, um, rather than just fitting a regression, which we did here, you can see that that highest concentration is significantly different from the others. And then for silver sides, the fish, um, we only see an effect of the nano size particles on the fish um, at the 15 and 25 parts per thousand, which again indicates that maybe there is something going on with agglomeration because you see a change in how those particles are affecting the fish depending on the salinity. And just to give you an idea of how we quantified ingestion, um, this is a shrimp up here. Uh, this is one of the larval fish. Um, and one of my graduate students, John Dickens, used a solution called cubic to clear their tissue so that you could then visualize where the particles were and actually get a, a, a decent estimate. And you can see here, he's put little um, measurement bars on some of these. Um, you can see that we can confirm that those particles are actually tire wear by confirming that their size is between that 1 and 20 micron um, fraction, which is what we know we created via cryo milling. So lots of questions as any as any research project um, will will do you you often generate more questions um, than you do answers. And so it looks like differences in ingestion between salinities could have affected how long the particle stayed in suspension, could have affected things like growth and ingestion. Um, and so that's something we plan to look further into. Uh, and so for behavior, I'm just showing a, a summary of some of the behavioral endpoints we looked at. And so the, the text is a little bit small, but you can see in these radar plots, um, which were put together by my postdoc, Dr. Samreen Siddiqui, you can see we looked at distance, um, angle of how the, the, the animals were turning meander, which is kind of how random their movement is, um, how long they were spending in a particular part of their habitat of the well, um, how 
often they were freezing. So freezing turns out to be a really important endpoint in um, mice and shrimp, which I'm not going to show that data today, but in fish, it was more about kind of the randomness of their movement. So it was almost as if they were having trouble making decisions about where to go next, which doesn't seem like a big deal. Um, but if you think about it, that type of change in behavior could then lead to things that were being seen by other labs, like changes in how they're selecting prey, potentially changes in how much prey they can acquire, or it could even potentially affect the risk of being predated upon. And these are forage fish that are really important. They're kind of in the middle of the food web and are a really important link between lower levels of the food web and um, and those uh, piscivores and other other larger larger species. And so mostly seeing, and this is across um, across all salinities and, and across most of the concentrations, even that lower 60 particles per mil, we're seeing changes in how much time they're spending um, in the middle of the well, as opposed to on the sides where they would be more protected, as well as kind of this um, this increase we see in meandering. And then it, not surprisingly, what goes along with the change in movement, the randomness of movement is a change in their turn angle. And so this is how quickly can they turn to move away maybe from something that's a threat or how quickly can they turn to grab to grab a prey item and we are feeding them um, we are feeding them live food while they're also being exposed to microplastics. We also looked at leachate, which is a big question right now, um, particularly with a recent study out of Washington State that saw that leachate from tire wear contained a compound toxic to salmonids. Um, and we don't see as much of an effect of leachate in the fish. And we did use one concentration of leachate at the highest potential concentration of plastic. So it relates to how much leachate would be present in a solution with 60,000 particles per mil. And we see some um, effects on turn angle and meander, but we only see that effect on um, where in the well the fish spends most of its time when there are particles present in the well. So a lot, a lot to dig into there. And we see, we also see effects on mice and shrimp, which I won't go into today. And then we're using a similar approach to look at acute responses to all of the other plastic types I was showing in that slide where we showed the different, um, the different milled plastic types using scanning electron microscopy. <clears throat> so the end goal of all of this is to assess the risk of some of these different particle types to freshwater, estuarine, and marine organisms. And that work is taking place across the three labs at Oregon State and then uh, Western Washington University uh, in the Landis Lab. That is where um, risk assessment modeling will be taking place. This is using something called a Bayesian approach. And so his group uses Bayesian networks, um, which are kind of a web of nodes that link cause and effect relationships. And this is done by using conditional probability to describe interactions <clears throat> and to generate the probability of an outcome or multiple outcomes. And we're initially going to be doing this modeling using some of the data from the San Francisco Bay estuary, but then adding in the data that we've collected in the lab on different plastic types. And so just to kind of put this into context, it's it's a basic framework that's been used for contaminants, non-indigenous species, flow rates, climate change. This is an approach that his group has been using for a number of years, not just for microplastics, but for pesticides, for other contaminants of, of emerging concern. So just to give you kind of a rough idea of where this is headed, and we don't have the risk assessment completed yet, this work, we've been working together for about a year, year and a half now, and mostly during COVID. So things have been happening, but maybe a little bit more slowly um, than they would otherwise. Um, this is just showing kind of a, a rough framework of how you would assess the risk of exposure to tire wear particles. And this is assessing the risk, not just to one species, but to an entire ecosystem. And so they think about sources, things like industry land use, road density, how much traffic is on that road? What is the season? How much is it raining? Um, different stressors 
including co-contaminants. So not just the tire wear particles by themselves, but thinking about it in a realistic scenario because the animals aren't just gonna be exposed to tire wear, they're exposed to pesticides, they're exposed to other industrial contaminants, to noise pollution, there are so many other factors. And then selecting particular species of concern, mostly things that we eat, like Chinook and herring and Olympia oysters and northern anchovy, and trying to quantify what, what the impacts will be on those, on those organisms based on data from surrogate species, like the ones we're using in the lab, and data from the field on occurrence of tire wear particles and other, um, other co-contaminants. And so that, that work is ongoing, and we hope to have, um, have more of a, an answer on um, what the risk of tire wear particles are based on the study in San Francisco and also based on our work um, at OSU um, in, in the coming year. So going forward, there, there is a lot of work to be done. We, we really need better estimates of environmental concentrations of smaller microplastics and someday nanoplastics when we have the technology to be able to measure them in the environment, um, especially those that appear to be easily ingested and assimilated by vulnerable organisms and life stages. We, we need a lot more data on tire wear, on fibers, which seem to be the things that are showing up the most, um, particularly in urban areas that may be more impacted by plastic pollution. Um, risk assessment should be based on size, shape, and the potential role of chemicals at, but, but thinking more about those chemicals on particles that are translocatable, that can actually persist in the tissue a bit longer. A high throughput testing similar to that used to assess soluble chemical toxicity is, is maybe the way to go for now when it comes to microplastic research, because we have so many combinations of plastics and envir environmental conditions to, to assess, to really get at um, what the risk might be from these different, these different types. And they're really, a tire wear particle is a completely different pollutant than a polystyrene sphere in many ways. And so they really need to be assessed um, independently. And consideration of multiple stressors, um, such as factors associated with climate change. And I've listed out temperature, hypoxia, and salinity stress. We're focused on salinity stress right now, but maybe once we hone in <clears throat> on which particle types are of most concern, we can also think about things like hypoxia and temperature um, in a, more of a multiple stressor um, type of exposure situation. So thinking about how an animal is going to experience its environment while it's being exposed to these pollutants is, is really important. So um, the work I talked about today, um, I want to emphasize again, is all part of this great collaborative project that's supported by the US National Science Foundation um, and is from the labs of Chris Langdon, Wayne Landis, uh, Stacey Harper, and, and myself. Um, and we formed a group called the Pacific Northwest Consortium on Plastics. Um, well, actually, uh, this is a group that consists of, at this point, over 150 different um, academic institutions, government agencies, nonprofits, and we hold quarterly teleconferences where we share our research and give people opportunities to, to ask questions and disseminate information from their own um, their own projects um, and even we even get to talk about policy sometimes, which is exciting. So I'll just I'll leave I'll leave a little plug for that here with our website and um, I'm happy to take questions if there's time. Thank you. <laughs>